dedicated to you fresh new today. I pray for your healing. Bring forth your deliverance, Lord God. For you want to set your people free. Freedom, freedom. You want to heal us, spirit, soul, and body, Lord God. Spirit, soul, and body. Soul, emotions just totally just ravaged deep inside. Full and trying to fake everyone else. And to, to, to include their selves, God. But God, they, you, you really see, you really know, and you really desire to be uh, partner with, partner with them, so that they might be free, free from their, their past, free from their faults, free from the, the, the things that that had traumatic experiences, Lord God, that happened to them, God, in Jesus' name. Lord God, it's time to be real. And may we be real and open before you today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Everyone said amen and amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We're going to take up this morning's tithes and offerings. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we lift up this offering before you. Jesus and, and Lord God just touch people's hearts to give. Open people's hearts, Lord God. In Jesus' name, Lord. To be obedient to your word, Lord God. In the tithe, to be obedient to you and in, in, in the offering, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The giant being held down. The giant Gulliver, the, everybody knows Gulliver's travel, but Gulliver the giant was being held down. And Gulliver was the giant, was the church being held down uh, by uh, little people. And the little people uh, represented the, the, the church, people with small dreams and small visions and, and low, low, low sight living. <laughs> But it's time for the head. He saw the head uh, uh, in Cleveland. The heart in Columbus. The reproductive organs in, in, in Cincinnati. The uh, right arm in, uh, in Indianapolis. The left arm uh, was in Philadelphia. And I forget where the other two were. Uh, the, the feet were in uh, Charlotte and uh, I forget where the other one was. The feet were in Charlotte and Atlanta. And, and Bob Jones saw the giant man, the church, stand up in Atlanta. And then he saw the, 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 the South being wholly won by the Lord and a sweeping revival starting all around but but it starts in in, in, in Ohio it's, it started it started in Cleveland as of yesterday that when we, we, we prayed that there was something in the atmosphere of heaven that just broke off things and chains and and and, and, and the ropes and I believe that the, 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 um, uh, the giant man the, the Gulliver the head is arising <laughs> uh, in Ohio and I think it's interesting the heart is in Columbus do you know what the shape of Ohio is it's the shape of the heart it's uh, the heartbeat state it's the heart state hallelujah and and that was their slogan for a long time the heart come visit the heartbeat state and I never knew that before until uh, I began to hear about that and I began to look at the state it's in the shape of a heart so it was no longer, it's the, the swing state just of presidential election. 
It's no longer as uh, the, 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 the state that swings the axe. As, uh, oh, what's his name? Dutch Sheets. Dutch Sheets, it says. And uh, those who travel with him. But it is the state where the head's going to arise. And it's arising now, beloved. There's things going to change. It might not look the same. Because <laughs> God wants to do some things. Some new things in people's hearts and lives. God wants to win this city. It was Reinhard Bonnke that, that, that seen the vision of, of America, all of America coming to the Lord, being saved, starting now. And this is a man who you would say, oh, he doesn't know anything. He's won over uh, millions of people to the Lord in Africa. And he's believing all of Africa is going to be saved. But he declared just recently that he saw all of America being saved. I'm not just talking about going to church or saying that they're Christian, but giving them their whole heart. And God wants your whole heart. God desires your whole heart and your whole life. You come to church, you can say, oh, I, I, I'm a Christian. But God desires your heart. I want to talk to you on a subject called the vow. V-O-W this morning. Said all that to lead up to this. A vow. A vow is an earnest promise to perform a specified act or believe in a certain manner, especially a solemn promise to live and act in accordance with the rules of a religious order, a declaration or assertion. Now, a, that's a vow, V-O-W. And I, I want to I want to just read to you a definition of a V O W E L a vowel. It is a speech sound such as or created by a relatively free passage of breath through the larynx or oral cavity. It usually forms the most prominent sound of a syllable. It is a very constant essence of the word. In other words, a vow is something you make toward God. You give your whole life. You, you promise yourself to give your life to God and perform what you said you're going to do. And a V-O-W, a vowel, is a word, a part of speech. And why do I say this? Uh, why do I give the definitions of these two? Because, beloved, if you want a, 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 to, a God to give you a word, a vowel, you must first have or make a vow before God. Let me say that again. And you got to get this, beloved. If you want God to give you a vowel, a word, then you must first have a vow before God. Or with God. You got to partner with God. What like God was saying in the word this morning earlier. That you must partner with him. If you want God to. to, to, to uh, whatever you want God for. You must partner with him. If you want God to give you revelation knowledge. You must partner with him. If you want to follow a flow in signs and wonders and dominion and authority, you got to partner with him. You got to have a vow with him. And I say this because of this, uh, a Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow. Nazarite vow was a consecration to the Lord. 
It was a dedication of, of, of their life, uh, uh, a choice they made, pe these people made, to consecrate and dedicate themselves to the Lord. And we see this in Numbers chapter 6, uh, verses 2 through 6. And this is what God says in Numbers chapter 6, 2 through 6. He says, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When a man or woman shall vow a vow, a vow of the Nazarite to be separated to the Lord. He shall separate from wine and strong drink and shall drink no wine and vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes nor eat the most grapes or, or, or moist grapes or dried. All the days of his Nazarite ship he shall eat nothing that is made of the grapevine. From grape seed even to the stems, all the days of his vow to separate. No razor shall come upon his head until the days were, are fulfilled in which he separates to the Lord. He shall be holy. He shall let his locks of hair of his head grow all the days that he separates to the Lord. He shall not come and he shall not come any near any dead body. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, this morning for your holy word. We ask you to bring breathe forth life. Holy Spirit, come. Let not a word drop to the ground, Lord God, the nata. Father God, come. In Jesus' name, penetrate our hearts like you ever do so gently, Father God. And speak to us, Lord God. Search in our hearts, Lord God, through your word this morning. And see if there's any wicked way inside of us. And lead us to the way of everlasting life, Lord God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So what is a Nazarite, you ask? The Hebrew word for Nazarite is Nazir. It is the base root word Nazir means to set apart. So literally translated to the person who takes a vow is not called a Nazarite. They're called a separated, set apart person. Whereas Nazir is a positive term that indicates being specifically, especially rather consecrated for service to God. They had to be separated from grapes, separated from the negative sense of being prohibited from grapes. Further, there is in the Hebrew word nazir, which literally means shoot or branch. It means the unpruned grapevine they had to stay away from. But the term also denotes the high priest's glory ahead, glorious headpiece. The one with the golden band around it. The, 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 it was really gold and, and gems and all, it was ornate. As well as the long hair of the Nazarite. So when reading these passages in Hebrew, we see the, uh, the parallel between the high priest's head covering, the special hat, and the Nazarite's head covering his long hair. The Hebrew words all work together to help us understand the relationship between priests, grapevines, and the Nazarite, and the Nazarites being consecrated, set apart for God. See, it's a correlation between priests and the Nazarites. Beloved, we're called as the royal priesthood. Priests before the minister before God. The priests were called to be separate, to be, to be consecrated, dedicated to God. The Nazarite made a vow, 
said uh, to partner, he, he, he partnered with God to set himself apart that, that, that he would not touch any anything of a grapevine, no strong drink, no, no hard liquor, no, no, no wine. He would not cut his hair and he would not touch any dead thing. God is calling you and I to be consecrated, holy, dedicated, set apart for him. And these people, the Nazarites who, the Nazarite people who took the Nazarite vow for a period, it was only for a period of time, but we as believers uh, live a, a consecrated, dedicated life every single day of our life. That's what we're supposed to do. From here into eternity. And we know we'll live a holy life on the other side throughout eternity. That means to be set apart. That means to be, uh, and, and people knew that who took a Nazarite vow. They knew because they were different. They didn't do the same things as, as other people did. They didn't look the same way as other people did. Because they, 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 were stand, they stood out. Different from the crowd. Beloved, we as believers are supposed to be standing out uh, in the crowd. Different. Uh, for uh, Not the same. So people can look and see and, and, and say, oh, there is, uh, there is God. There is Jesus. I see him in that person. When you're drinking alcohol, when you when you going out to the clubs, when you're going out to the different places, and you're doing the same things as the world does, they look at you and say, "If that's how God is, I don't want to have anything to do with that." It's time to stop mocking God with the things that you do. And be consecrated. God is looking for people to be consecrated, dedicated, and holy before him. And he gives you the power through the power of the Holy Spirit to do the things that God wants you to do and how to live. He just doesn't say things, nice things in the word just to say, oh, that's pretty good. Like in Hebrews, it said, be holy for I am holy. It says it throughout the word. It says, follow, be, be at peace with all men and follow holiness. Without it, no man shall see the Lord. God is, is, is looking for the Nazarites of today. Those who will consecrate. I'm not talking about growing your hair long or, 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 or anything of that nature. But what I'm telling you, talking about this morning, those who set yourself apart and look, look, look like you're apart from the world and not in it, not of it rather. That's what the word of God says, be in the world and not of it. But many people are in the world and of it. Going to the same places, doing the same things as the world does. Some people try to do in a secret, but God knows and sees everything in your heart. That's why God wants you to partner with him. God wants you to give your whole heart to him. It's time to stop playing games. It's time to, to, to get in and, and, and fully say, Jesus, I surrender my heart. I surrender my life, Lord God. I just don't want to play the games, Lord God. And if you have problems, you need to go to him and say, Jesus, I need your help. And, and if, if need be, if you still have problems in certain areas of addiction or you need to be set free, you need to find somebody to be people to be accountable to that will help you out, that will lead you by the Holy Spirit so you get set free. Hallelujah. Now there's three components, as we read before, of the Nazarite vow. Number one was no, no wine or strong drink. No wine or strong drink. 
According to, to some Jewish scholars, Israel is often symbolized by a grapevine. The idea that every Sabbath year is the seventh year, the land of Israel is consecrated to the Lord. Fields are not to be harvested. Land is not to be tilled or weeded. And as concern, uh, uh, concerns our study, vineyards are not to be tended. They just let them go. Not only must grace be left on the vine to, to, to rot, even the much necessary twice yearly pruning of the grapevines was suspended during the seventh year, which was a sabbatical year. The year that the land was set apart and set aside for God. So the Nazarite is set apart and set aside for God for a certain time. During that time, Nazarite, the Nazarite symbolizes the purpose of Israel. Holy and set apart for the Lord. And the purpose of the Sabbath year is to symbolize that holiness and set apartness of Israel. Therefore, just as the grapevines are not to be touched and no grapes harvested during the sabbatical year, the Nazarite are not to touch or eat grapes during the term of their vow. However long or short they make their vow, which is in essence is kind of like a specialized sabbatical year for the Nazarite. See, the complete abstinence from grapes in that day was representative of giving up worldly pleasures. The fruit of the vine symbolizes life, vitality. Not only was intoxicating drink and withheld, but also... Wine, which is made from rotten, fermented grapes. Come on, that's what wine is, rotten grapes. <laughs> if you think about rotten grapes, would you eat a rotten grape on the ground just smooshed and, and stinking? No, but you could, people drink it. It represents worldly pleasures found in rotten, putrefied areas of a worldly life. God given, nevertheless, God given pleasures in which per people, persons may partake without guilt and sin were likewise excluded for a period of time. They didn't touch even grape juice. They weren't allowed to pick grapes off and eat them because they're being set apart. This was a fast of pleasure, a self imposed, uh, uh, type of lifestyle that was engaged in, in to keep a person from being distracted from worldly by worldliness in order to draw close to God and perform extraordinary exploits for him. So what does that mean for me today? Pastor Tony, what you talking about? What's this, is it relevant for me today? That's the, what the world is talking about. That's what the church is talking about. Hey, what, what, what's it mean for me now? Come on, what's the bottom line? So as Christian believers, we are to live in this world, yet separated from the world. Anything that intoxicates us, anything that intoxicates us, Money, fame, lust of the flesh, etc. will ultimately dull the spiritual senses and draw us away from God. Today we live in the substance of what was pictured in that beautiful ritualistic act of being separated from the grapevine. 
We who believe live in the true meaning of what the act was all about, the symbolism was all about. Refrain from becoming intoxicated by anything that may draw us away from intimacy with God. No wonder the Bible talks about uh, 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 staying away from drinking and, and alcohol all through the Bible from, 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 uh, from the beginning to the end. Solomon says that he was the most wisest man of all because he asked God for wisdom and understanding how to lead his people. He said this, wine is a, a, a mocker and strong drink is a brawler. Anyone who drinks is unwise. Isn't that true, you know? People, you see people, you, you, get, you ever see people get, in, in a, in a, a, get, get drunk and they're drunk and they, they want to fight and they get people, they want to punch people's lights out, they get nasty and mean. <sighs> so we got to be separated. Well, I've everyone listening to me uh, 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 on the sound of my voice out there on the internet and, and here. You can't be at the bar stool on Saturday night toasting it up. Yeah, you say, oh, I'm toasting up. I'm talking about Jesus. You might be talking about Jesus, but not in the right way. <laughs> People damning God. Come on, folk. Come on, beloved. We got to be separated from, from the, the, these things of the world. Because they draw us away from intimacy. They draw us away from, from our whole hearts being, being surrendered to the Lord. In Galatians in 5, it talks about, it, it mentions about a list about things that are that will keep you out from, from seeing God, the kingdom of God. They'll keep you away from 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 the <laughs> from the dominion and authority that you need you to have with partnering with God with your whole life, being set apart. See the Nazarite only like I said only did it for a period of time, but we are to live a consecrated, dedicated, holy life set apart for, for God for, for a lifetime. Uh, everybody, and most of you know uh, 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 that under saw my voice, but uh, uh, years ago, this has been about two decades ago, a decade or two ago, uh, in, in, the, in the late 80s, 90s, early 90s. But I used to be an alcoholic. You know what? I don't touch that stuff. I don't want to go near that stuff anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Because I, I want to be, I, I, when I, I said, Jesus, I give you my whole heart. I stay away from that junk. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Oh, you don't want a communion wine? No, I don't want any communion wine. Just give me the piece of bread that represents the broken body and, and I'll, I'll just pass, the wine, pass that wine right up. So I don't want to have no taste of it. I don't want to have nothing to do with it. And that's what we got to have. A desire, to, whatever it is. Say, so God, I want to be separated. I want to be consecrated to you. In every area of my life, and that's just one of the areas that, that, that they did refraining from becoming intoxicated by anything that might draw us away from intimacy with God. If alcohol is your poison, if, if that's your, your your addiction, if you have a secret addiction, whatever it is, if you have a secret addiction, some people have pornography, some people have alcohol, some people even have drugs that nobody else knows about. 
But God wants to set you free. God wants you to be set apart for him. And being set apart for him, he wants you to partner with him. That seems to be the theme today, partnering with God. So you can't do it on you. You can't get set free from the, the, the addictions on your own. You need to partner with somebody that, that, that can set you free and will set you free. Partnering with God and allowing the Holy Spirit to come in. Because if that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead fully lives in you, Somebody say, it keeps on, if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, dwells in you. You know what? It fully lives inside of you. He will quicken your mortal body. He will make you take those addictions out. That, that's your soul, your heart, and, and your mind. And your body. It will quicken your mortal body. Take any chemical chemical addiction out from, from from you. You no longer have a desire for it anymore. So that's the first thing. No wine or strong drink. Now touch nothing dead or unclean is the second thing we're going to take a look at in the Nazarite vow. Touch nothing dead or unclean. See, beloved, they, they couldn't even come into the same room as a dead person. So if somebody in their family died, they couldn't even go to the funeral. They couldn't go to the funeral home and, and view them because they were set apart. Separation. The separation from corruption of death accentuates his or her or his holiness and the attachment to that which is incorruptible. Touching dead things or even coming close to, to death would make a Nazarite unclean. That's the vow they took. You to make them unclean. Then they have to shave their head and start on and repent and, and do the whole thing over again. See, as Christians, we are to stay away from things that lead to spiritual death. That's sin. This ritual refraining, the, this ritual means don't go near sin because sin will bring spiritual death. That's what Romans 6.23 says. What does it say? For the wages of sin is what? Death. Separation from God. Touching dead things. Dead religion. Dead works. Programs set up by man and they're wondering why churches are going down. Instead of up. Oh, if only we do this and do that. What did the Lord say? What did God the Lord say? Unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor and work in vain. It's to no effect. Because they're just trying to do things to make things work. But we got to listen to what God says and how to do it. And not just say, oh, that's a good word, God. But we got to put feed to what he says to do. Because if we don't do what he says to do, guess what? It's dead works. It's dead religion. It's just like in, in Corinthians, where he's talking about the, the priest. It's just like a sang, a clanging gong, gong, gong cymbals. Because priests wore these tassels and bells and whistles, and then they would, when they moved, ching, 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 everybody knew that they were coming through the door. Oh, wow, there's a priest. Wow, we got to look at the priest. Look. They wanted to make a big spectacle of themselves. But as Paul says, you can have everything. You can do this, but it's a sound and clang, gong, gong, and everything else. We're talking about the love of God in, in, in the love chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it's being, oh, that's a great, wonderful scripture. But it, what it really means to partner with God. And when you partner with God, his love comes in and invades your life. 
And then you begin to do things that are not of yourself to make yourself look and shine. You look, you're only a sign pointing to one in Jesus Christ. Because that's the job of the Holy Spirit now in our lives is to point to the, whole, uh, uh, the one who is worthy of it all, Jesus Christ. See, I like about the, the, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They don't brag about themselves. They point to somebody else. Jesus points to the Father, and the Holy Spirit points to Jesus. We're to be set apart. Stay away from sin. I had a dream once of these these uh, I was in a, a house and I walked in and there was in their living room these people had these spiders and they weren't in cages or anything like that and they had these snakes crawling around and, and these things were like awesome looking they were beautiful colors I was like man that's the uh, I don't really care for spiders but these spiders like, man these, these are pretty cool looking they don't look like creepy little things they look like little powder puffs or whatever crawling around it's like man that's pretty cool and the snakes beautiful like purple and green and blue blue colored snakes and it's just not that big either they're only like two three foot snakes the colorful snakes they 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 they, they look pretty cool and as I got up closer to them And they look close, like, draw me to them in the dream. And, and as I w went down to try to touch one of them, went up to snap at me, take a bite with his poisonous fangs. Uh, beloved, in, in the world, there's things in the world that might look tempting, might look tasty, but it leads to death. It's just like the snake that looked beautiful in the dream. But it was poisonous to the place. It would draw you in and, and want, make you want to touch it and play with the snake. But the snake is poisonous and deadly. It will kill you. Just like playing with the world. Death. Sin. It will kill you spiritually and if you're not if you, you and, and we know that people are addicted and out there and, and they have problems of, it can lead to death spiritually and physically thank God uh, uh, last night we begin we broke we begin to break the, that 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 uh, that spirit of death through pharmacia through drugs, I won't say alcohol because alcohol is a part of the drug in this in this state that's ravaged young people and older people alike. They're dying by by the by the hundreds because of opioids, uh, chemically and uh, made drugs that come in. But we begin to pray and break that off. So God wants you to be separated, set apart for him. And the third thing, no razor shall come on his head. The hair was a part of the human anatomy that was seen as very important in the Middle, Middle Eastern cultures. Hair was considered to be the seed of man's vitality and life force. Hair in the pagan world was often as a, uh, offered as a burnt sacrifice to the gods and goddesses that they served. Therefore, as the hair was thought to be the seed of life, then it was the hair that carried the defilement that the Nazarite might incur. In the same way, the hair carried the purity of the person's life force. When the Nazarite properly completed his vow period, his or her uh, his uh, uh, hair was shaved off of the head and burned as an offering to the Lord, because it was pure and clean, as, and it was offered to God. 
The hair of the defiled Nazarite was not offered to God. Depending on the air, it was either burned up in a common fire or buried. As believers, we now live under the authority of the sovereign uh, covering of the Lord. We live under the authority and covering of God. We were bought with a price that he paid on the cross. Therefore, we belong to him and we are covered. We are in covenant union with him. We are partnering with him. That's what a covenant union is. Partnering with God. Today, we demonstrate submission through the way we conduct our own lives. Under the authority of another through dependence and obedience through dependence and obedience. We seek him for guidance and counsel. We obey his word. We live our lives to serve him and please him. Living this kind of lifestyle today is a greater testimony to the world than a ritual act of growing one's hair long. In this day, hair is grown, not or not grown. As a matter of fact, there's a, it, it's your preference of what you, <laughs> how you style it. Some are bald and have no choice in the matter. Therefore, the length in this era, this, this generation of now, gives no meaning, the meaningful testimony to the world. You can have a mohawk, you can have, I've, I've seen people that have spiked hair with, with, with different colors and the anointing coming off their lives so, so, so strong that they, they see people raised from the dead in their ministries. Doesn't matter. Long length, hair length in this era gives no meaningful testimony to the world. And testimony is what the ancient Nazarite's long hair was all about. Today, obedience and devotion to God conveyed the stronger testimony to the world. This is a testimony that cannot be ignored. It is important to remember the Old Testament ritual acts were shadows and types of the reality that was to come. It was a shadow and type of the better thing to come. The substance of the shadows and types is Christ himself, who was spiritually speaking the, the perfect Nazarite. Even though it does not say that he took a Nazarite vow, he lived a life that was set apart, consecrated in, in, and, and dedicated to, to the Father. His empowerment, the Holy Spirit, rather by his example and through his empowerment of the Holy Spirit, through his empowerment, beloved. And by his example, we can live the true meaning of the Nazarite vow. By his example and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. Through, by his example and through the empowerment of Holy Spirit, we can live in the true meaning of the Nazarite vow to be separated, set apart. We're rounding around home here. I want to talk to you about two Nazarite people in the Bible that had Nazarite vows in their lives. The first one is Samuel. At his birth, he was given to God, consecrated and dedicated by his mom, Hannah, who before he was born, she could not have children, and God blessed her with Han I mean, Samuel. We see this in 1 Samuel 1, 1 through 28. I'm, I'm not going to uh, read the whole thing. You can read it on your own for time's sake. 
to support it. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your handmaid and remember me and not forget your handmaid, but will give your your, your handmaid a man, man child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And there will be no razor come upon his head. And it happened as she continued to pray with the Lord. And then we know the priest came and said, Hey, woman, stop drinking. You're babbling. You're drunk. And she said, No, 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 sir. I'm just travailing in prayer so hard. Trembling before the, the, the awesomeness of God. Because I want a child. I want a child. And... and and she said, oh, let it be to you. This is okay. And she went home and, 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 and rejoiced. And, they had, and she had Samuel. And then there was the time. Well, it's at the beginning of Samuel's ministry. The beginning of Samuel's ministry. See, uh, uh, Hannah made that vow. God, I'm going to give you to the uh, him to to serve you for the all the days of his life. He's yours, God. A Nazarite vow. And something changed in Hannah's life. She had desperation about her, and she she made a vow to God. And because she made a vow to God, and God answered her by giving her a child, Samuel. God gave her a V-O-W-E-L, a word. Beginning of Samuel's ministry, there was Samuel. He was in, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. He was in, in, the, in the temple and doing his service duty. And at night, he went down to sleep, Samuel, and he heard the word, his name, Samuel, Samuel. And he caught up and thought it was Eli. He went into Eli's room, bedroom. Hey, Eli, what do you want? He's like, because I was like, what are you talking about? Anything? It's, 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 I didn't say anything. Go back to bed, young man. And he heard again, Samuel, Samuel. Then he got up and said, Eli, what do you really want? Are you talking in your sleep? But he didn't say that. But I can imagine him saying, What are you talking in your sleep that you don't know you're calling me? Then Eli realized, he had a revelation, ding, the lights came on. He said, you know what? I know who that is. That's God talking to you. Next time, just respond to him. And he heard his name again, Samuel. And Samuel responded to God. See, Samuel had a vow, a pact, or a consecrated covenant on his life from God. And because of it, Samuel received a word, a vow, a word from God that established him in his destiny. Samuel was obedient to carry out the vow on his life. And God continually spoke vow the word to him openly. See, Samuel had revelation from God which pursued, produced the manifestation of God. Let me say that again. Samuel had revelation from God which produced the manifestation from God. He had an intimate re revelation. He had an intimate knowledge of God. He had an intimate experience with God. As some people say, said and say that he eats, he ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner with God. Samuel had revelation from God, which produced the manifestation of God. Now let's briefly talk about Samson. Here is Samson, another Nazarite. His birth, 
Judges chapter 13, 1 through 7. And the sons of Israel did evil against the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered the hand of Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man, Zorah, the family of Danites, the name of the, uh, whose name was Manoah, and his wife barren for, 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 uh, uh, could not bear child. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now you are barren and do not, uh, are not uh, able to bear children. Can you imagine the word like that? Hey, you're, yeah, you're barren. You can't have children. Wow, what a revelation. But right here, he goes on. But you shall conceive and bear a son, and now please take heed, and do not drink wine, and do not drink wine or strong drink, and do not eat any unclean thing. Do not eat any unclean thing, for, for you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the, from the womb. He was also chosen by God to be a Nazarite from the mother womb. And he was probably taught that. You know, this is what you have to do. You have to partner with God in your Nazarite vow. But Samson was disobedient to the vow. Number one, he touched dead or unclean things. Samson put his hand inside a dead carcass of a lion to get honey. As found in Judges chapter 14, verse 8 and 9, after the time that returned to take her, he returned aside and, and to see uh, the dead body of a lion. And behold, he swarms of bees of honey were in the dead body of a lion. And he reached in and put his hands in and tucked the, the honey and started eating it. Took honey out of a dead lion. He touched the dead thing. See, the honey was enticing, but it was still in a dead, an unclean thing. And he touched it, which he was supposed to be separated from. And he was, number two, he was associated with prostitutes. Judges chapter 16, 1. And Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there, and he went in to, with her. And number three, Delilah and, uh, and allowing his hair to be cut. Uh-oh. Judges 16, 16, and 17. And it happened because she distressed him with her words daily and urged him with his soul. He was grieved to death. And he told her all he told her all his heart and said to her, A razor shall not come upon my hair, for I am a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I will become weak and like any man. So we know what happened. That night she cut his hair. Cut his hair off. She probably went to Walmart and got the, the, that whale, you know, personal, uh, uh, personal stylings uh, razor. <laughs> No, he cut, she cut his hair off. So we found out what happened to Samson. He was taken, bound up, blinded, and made to work like a donkey, grinding stones in the stone mill, or walking around the mill. One thing I like about that story is that God is always in the process of restoration because he uh, repented. He repented and his hair grew back because he'll remember the vow he made to God. When they were celebrating, all the, all the Philistines were celebrating in the temple. Hey, Bring Samson out. We're going to have sport of him. And a little a young man led him to the pinnacle of the temple. And he took out more Philistines in his last act. Pushed the pillars over. And the whole temple came down on all the Philistines. He killed more Philistines at the end of his life 
than all of his all of his all of his days that God came upon him. Thank God for his mercy and grace. And on a side note, that's a I, I can see that that that's that's like the church doing ministry for all that time. The eyes of understanding being put out. People while the church at the time been walking blind, low sighted. No strength, no authority, no power. But as the church begins to repent and partner with God again, when you and I begin to partner with God again, at the end of the church age, there's more exploits for God than ever before in the history of the church. <laughs> more salvation than ever before. Hallelujah. We're believing for the whole world to be saved. I believe it's Reinhard Bonnke that's believing for one billion people to be saved. Why not believe for seven billion people, every person on planet Earth, to come to that heart knowledge and surrendering their heart to God? Beloved Samson had a vow on his life, but he was compromised and did not obey his vow through his life. Because of his disobedience and his vow, he only had manifestation, not revelation. See, Samson had, Samuel rather, had a vow on his life to be consecrated, set it apart. And because of his intimate partnership with God, he had revelation. He had revelation that led to manifestation of God's power and strength. And because of Samson's disobedience to the vow, he only had manifestation, not revelation. Because he did not have that partnership with God. Beloved, we need that revel heart knowledge uh, 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 to, to see the revelation from heaven that leads to the manifestation of God's presence through us like Samuel and not just going through the motions and, and, and saying oh God I want I need your power I need your strength and go out there blow it do uh, all these things and uh, and at times we could see the the anointing come on you, people. But but it, it comes and goes because you're, you're, you're and you cannot judge your life as being pleasing to God because of the God will you uh, of the anointing that moves through you because God will use anybody or anything. But it's that heartfelt partnership with Him. That leads to the revelation that God speaks to you. And the Holy Spirit confirms to you that you are his child, his son and daughter. That revelation that leads to the manifestation of God's power through you. So God is speaking to everyone. He wants you to be a partner with him. Let's pray. He wants to partner with you. He wants all of us to give our whole life to him, our whole hearts. So this morning, if that's you, God talking to you from the beginning uh, when, when God spoke the word that he wants to partner with us in the destiny of, of our lives and partnering a, a heart, giving our whole hearts and, and having uh, the revelation come through the, the word, his word to us, and the manifestation coming through that revelation from a heartfelt partnership with him. Because it's all about Jesus. 
Jesus, Jesus. It's nothing else about anything else but about Jesus. And you and I partnering with him. If you're here at the sound of my voice, you're here at the sound of my voice. Speaking to those over the internet as well. This is a time for this is the time to 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 reflect. This is a time to uh, uh, act. God is calling you and I to be separate, to be set apart, to partner with Him with all of our hearts. And nobody looking around, every eye closed, every head bowed in His place. A reverence to the Lord. If you're out there and you need. You desire God to to just grab a hold of your whole heart. You want to partner with God. I want to pray with you this morning. I'm not going to have a show of hands or anything of that nature. But I want all of us to pray. Pray from your heart. Pray from your life. And, and and I'm going to pray, and I want you to, it's, you know, this quintessential prayer, repeat the prayer. But mean, if you, you desire to give God your whole heart and life, to partner with him, I'm just going to pray. I want everyone in this place to repeat this prayer. But if if you're the one or ones out there or in here and and this is decision time because it's about Jesus and you say I want to partner with God I want you to pray and be be serious about this so I want everybody to pray this after me Jesus I give you my whole heart I want to partner with you I give you my life. And Lord, when I receive revelation, I want to do, I want to do what you say for me to do. Because it's not just about hearing, but it's about doing. It's action. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this moment of time. For those who have prayed this prayer in their own heart and life. That, uh, Lord God, I, I just ask you to let your Holy Spirit come alive to them. As they begin to partner with you with their whole heart and their whole life. That they might begin to have the faith and to believe you to trust you as you show them as you give them a word of vow because they have made a vow with you they partner with you to be separated set apart consecrated for you in Jesus name solidify it by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray a blessing on everyone here. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Shalom. Nothing broken, nothing lacking. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Everyone said, Amen.